This is the Lightning Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Castellino. This show is all about inspiring God's people to read, study, and meditate on His Word. This episode, what I want to talk about is something, this is something I've been thinking about for a while now, kind of studying about and observing and I'm going to try to be as concise and clear as I can. It's a kind of a big topic and there's a lot that we can explore, but I'm going to look at scripture and I'm going to try to make sense as much as I can. Uh, but I think this is something that can be really helpful. If you're a Christian, if you're looking at the world today and you're trying to make sense of how people behave uh, who don't know the Lord, why they act the way they act, what motivates them, what is driving them, what they think, what they believe. Uh, if you live in the West, you might convince yourself that most people are largely non-religious. They may not be openly atheist. Okay, There's a lot, plenty of atheists in Europe and in America who openly say they don't believe in God, they don't practice any kind of form of religion. But even people who claim to have some sort of vague uh, acceptance of God or, or of some sort of belief, they'll say they're not religious, but they think they're spiritual. Uh, you might not understand what really motivates them. What do they believe? How do they operate? Because if you look in uh, the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, that talks about the very end times before the coming of Christ, it's very emphatic to say humanity is continuing to worship false gods. Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, and one of several verses to talk about this after some of the plagues uh, are striking the earth during the tribulation period, you know, years leading up to the return of Christ. It says in Revelation 9, verse 20, the rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Now, in the modern world, especially in America, in the West, that's where I live, that's where I'm from, we don't have people openly worshipping demons or idols of gold, silver, brass, stone. If you think about that verse and you put it in the context of the Bible, you think of people literally bowing down and worshipping statues made of gold and silver. And the Bible says these aren't real gods. There are no such thing as pagan gods. There's only one God. There's only one creator. All these other gods are false gods. And even Paul explains in 1 Corinthians, these, what they're really worshiping are demons, as it says here. But if you look in the rest of the world, that kind of idolatry is very common, especially in the East, in the Far East, in different countries all over the world. There are literal idols and statues that they worship or they honor, they offer incense to, they, they say it's a symbol of one of their gods. You see statues like Buddha that are essentially idols and other figures like that. And you can say, okay, well, that makes sense for them. What about in the West? We don't do that. And some pastors and, and will rightfully explain that idolatry is when you worship anything other than God. Anything that's more important to you, that gives you hope, that gives you pleasure, that gives you purpose, that you look to, that, that teaches you, that guides you, that gives you meaning for life, that isn't our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ built upon the foundation of his word, is an idol. And so we say things like, well, that means that like, your job can be an idol and all these abstract things. But if you look at this passage, it still says very clearly that they're worshiping idols of gold and such. So we could take it as a figurative thing, but it still might be difficult for us to see it in the world. And if you take anything away from this podcast, it's the importance of studying scripture and thinking about it and meditating on it so that you could see it applied in your life. And one of the ways we do that is by looking at the world around us from the perspective of the word of God. So when we see things happening in our culture, in our society, in our communities, we don't go, well, I don't know what this is about or why these things are happening. Or even worse, it, it, try to explain them and understand them from a secular, worldly point of view. Because that's not what God wants. He wants us to think like him, which is based on the Bible, rather than thinking like the world, which is rooted in the lies of the enemy. So when we are trying to understand what's going on in our society today, and we say that the Bible says that people are idol worshippers, they worship false gods. When we look at our culture, we say, people don't worship false gods. If anything, they say they believe in one God. They just don't know him. What I want to put forward today is the idea that Humanity, no matter where they live, no matter what culture they're a part of, no matter what, what society, America or anywhere else, they are still practicing some form of religion. Human beings, from the very beginning, were created to worship. We see in the garden, God made Adam and Eve to know him and to fellowship with him. And worship meant having a relationship with their creator and being obedient to what he taught them. 
And, and back then it wasn't very difficult. He said, fill the earth, subdue it. You know, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the animals. Just, just be uh, the, the beings I created you to be. Except one rule, don't eat from this one tree. Very simple. But if they obeyed him and did that, they would be worshipping him. But instead we know they disobeyed him. And when they obeyed the lies of Satan to eat from that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were actually worshipping Satan. Now, they may not have been conscious that they were worshiping Satan, but you see the pattern. They rejected God's truth, believed the lies of the enemy, and did what Satan was leading them to do. When you do something that someone tells you to do, you're obeying them. And we know spiritually, biblically, obedience is a part of worship. We see that taught in 1 Samuel and in Romans. We offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice to God as an act of obedience. It's a spiritual form of worship. Adam and Eve weren't aware of it, but it didn't matter. They were doing it openly disobeying God's word and bowing down to Satan. That was the first moment of idolatry because Adam and Eve were worshiping Satan, obeying his command by doing what God told them not to do. And that is kind of the template of idolatry. And that's kind of the template of all sin when you break it down. So in our uh, Western world, humanity is just as religious as anywhere else in the world, but the religion they practice isn't a conscious, organized, formal religion, not, not in the way that they would articulate it as, but it is very much a secular religion. That's the term that I like to use when trying to articulate or understand the, you know, the whys and the hows and the ways of this fallen, sinful world that we're living in. They may not be openly worshiping a god, or some or numerous gods or in a false religion, they may not be Buddhist or Hindu or worshiping some some Wiccan, some pagan religion, but they are just as religious as anyone else. It's just their gods that they worship are secular. And there's scripture to explain the condition of the world in this day and age. I'm going to read through several passages of scripture that kind of give us insight into the condition of fallen humanity who does not know Christ, who has not yet been saved and redeemed from their sin, and has made God, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the true being that they worship and adore. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul's talking to the church, and he says in verse 17, Brethren, join and follow my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have often told, and now tell even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So we see here, people who do not follow Jesus, who who are enemies, Paul says, of the cross of Christ, what marks their behavior and their characteristics? Well, he says whose end is destruction, because that's what they have to look forward to, the wrath and punishment of God, but whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So we're going to think about that. We're going to hold on to that for a moment. And then let's go on to another passage. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is instructing Timothy and he says in verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly states that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he goes on in in a much longer passage, but it gives us quite a bit of information. 2 Timothy 3, starting at verse 1, he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. There's one more passage I want to touch upon, but let me, let's look over these three passages. In Philippians 1, Timothy and 2 Timothy, Paul is describing the state of fallen people, particularly people who lived during the last days. Okay, that's the time we're in, the final days before the end times, that they will live very uh, immoral and wicked lifestyles. But notice in these three passages, he never mentions that they're worshiping idols. We see in Revelation that there'll be many people who absolutely will be worshiping idols of silver and gold that are, are, are being influenced by demons. But in Philippians 3, he says these, these people who are enemies of Christ, their God is their belly. It says in 1 Timothy 4, there's no mention of false gods. They're following doctrines of 
demons, deceiving spirits. They're going to be speaking lies, hypocritical lies. They'll have their consciences completely burned. They're pushing strict uh, rules that control the body, but there's no love for God, no appreciation for God's things. Second Timothy 3, that long list, talks about the immorality and the, um, the disobedience, the wickedness. But again, he doesn't mention idolatry. So what am I saying about all this? What I'm saying is Paul is describing in the times we live in now, People would be worshiping, okay? They'll be engaging in, in the same kind of idolatrous immorality and evil that we saw throughout history, particularly in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. This kind of wickedness and corruption. But the gods they worship will look very differently than the gods of the past. Philippians 3 is a very key verse. He says their God is their belly. And that's so interesting because and during, the, during the time that Paul wrote this, very few people would have been quote-unquote secular. There are very few people who would have said, I don't believe in God. There's always been people throughout history who deny the existence of God or spirit, spiritual realm or anything like that. Even going back as far as you could look into history, there have been people who denied that. Okay, it's much more common today because they could fall back on claims like evolution and the Big Bang. It's all been, it was one big cosmic mistake that we are even here, so there's no creator God. But even back in ancient times, they had these kinds of ideas. But it was still rare. In Paul's day, we see in the book of Acts, every city he went to, there were idols and temples to false gods, and they were worshiping. Even in Athens, it was so bad. Paul was, was just overwhelmed by the, the amount of idolatry and wickedness. That was common in that world. But today, if you go to any major city, you're not going to see those kinds of obvious idols. But humanity is every bit as idolatrous as they were back then. It's just now, it's particularly in America, in the West, it's a secular religion. Openly, they're not acknowledging literal gods, whether the God of the Bible or any other god. But in their heart, they worship false gods that fit their own particular religion. And it's religious in every imaginable way. They have their own doctrines. They have their own ceremonies. They have their own rituals. They have a hierarchy of leadership that they revere and acknowledge. There's even um, the sense of blind obedience to their tenets, even though it might contradict what's obvious in front of them. Okay, that's what we call religious zealotry. Okay, if you try to understand what makes an unbeliever tick, what drives them, we need to look at the way they live their life from the perspective of a religion. Okay, they're not just secular people who are just making it up as they go along. It is very much as organized and as formal as any religion that exists. It's just packaged differently. So they think they're a liberated secular person. They're not being dominated by any church or religion or God. They can do as they please. But when you begin to probe into what they believe, into what they think about the world, it is as religious and as strict and as dogmatic as any religion that's out there, any false religion. Okay, and we see that particularly in the realm of politics. Okay, both on the right and on the left of American politics, there are people who would define themselves by their political views. Okay, very much like doctrine of a church. Okay, they adhere to those views very strictly, and if you disagree with them, you are, you're branded a blasphemer. You are bl branded a heretic. And they will do everything they can to destroy your life. Why? Because you disagree about politics? No, because you are an enemy of their religion. It's no different than some religious zealot in some church or some uh, mosque out there who thinks they need to kill the infidels because they are violating their gods. Same thing with people who worship a secular religion. The God isn't a God up in heaven or on some throne. The God is themselves. The heart of all true idolatry, the God that the, a human being worships, is himself. Just like Adam and Eve, when they ate from the tree, they weren't supposed to. The Bible says it was desirable for food, it was pleasing to the eye, and it was desirable to make one wise. Those three temptations appealed to Adam and Eve's self. It looked pretty, it tasted good, and it was going to make them wise, it was going to make them like God. That all idolatry is a path to making the human, the person, God. The God of their own throne. But in order to get that, in order to achieve that, they have to pursue some path to godliness. If you look at the world today, if you go to any bookstore or go on Amazon and look at the self-help section, there's all these books with commandments, rules, and rituals you have to follow. If you follow them perfectly, if you do all the right things, if you check every box, if you follow these strict, you know, do not taste, do not touch, as Paul said, deny this food, deny this, don't do this, don't do that, they claim you will achieve the type of life that you want. 
Whether it has to do with money or business or relationships or your health or your physical body, it's just as religious if you went to a church and they said, in order to please God, you have to follow these commandments, you have to follow these rules, you have to participate in these rituals, in these events, these ceremonies, and if you do this, you'll please God and you will get A, B, and C, all these blessings. It's no different. It's in fact, it's, it's even more religious than some religions because they have to, if they mess up a little bit, they'll immediately lose uh, the progress that they were hoping to achieve. And even in religion, when you mess up, there's usually a sacrifice you could make or some sort of atonement. You can make up for what you lost. But yet in the secular religion, it's even harsher than that. In the secular religion, it's all on you and your strength. It's even more religious and severe than most outward religions. And that's why Paul goes into great detail in 2 Timothy. If you look at this passage, it describes people who are putting themselves at the center of their life. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you look over that list, it's a very long list and it's very intense. Paul loves making very intense, very dramatic lists in his letters. And he does that because he's extremely thorough, both good and bad. Like we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. He explains these nine fruits that go into great detail about what it means to be in the Spirit. But when he talks about sinfulness, he goes into great detail because he's not going to leave anything out. Because he's being guided by the Holy Spirit to educate us, to teach us the Word of God, and he's very thorough. And so here, if we look at this list, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors. Okay, all of this speaks of a person who cares very much about themselves over anything else. If you look even during the time that Paul wrote this, he says this is going to happen in the last days or the latter times. That's the time that we're living in now. Broadly speaking, the last days is sometimes referring to the time after Christ had come, his first coming, up until his second coming. But in these contexts, Paul is talking about the time right before the return of Christ, right before the seven years of tribulation, prior to the rapture and the rise of the Antichrist and all those things. He's talking about the very last days that mark that period of time. And it's a very different time from any other time in the world. Because in Paul's day, even uh, pagans and Gentiles and unbelievers, they weren't as self-centered as this. Yes, there were always immoral people, and you could look at this list and say, humanity has always been that bad. Yes. But what's interesting is that deeply religious people that worship a god, they're not very self-centered. That's a worldview that's very unlike the worldviews in the Middle East, in Asia, in the Far East. Believe it or not, their worldview doesn't put them at the center. It puts some sort of god at the center, or their community at the center, their family, their heritage, their nation. They actually understand they're a small piece of a much larger uh, community or being or church or God. And so they're, they're just as sinful. They need Christ just as much as anyone else. They need to repent. They need to turn to God and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But their mindset's very, they're not, they're not the center of the universe. Okay. They understand that they're, they're a small piece of a larger uh, community, a larger thing. Okay. They need to understand that larger thing is Almighty God and the kingdom of heaven, but they still understand their place. What Paul's describing here are people that are very different than that. Okay, it's much more common these days around the world, but particularly in America, in the West, we have this mindset that we are the center of everything. Everything revolves around us, at least in my life. They love themselves. They love money. It's very interesting. The first thing he says is lovers of themselves. He's setting the tone for this uh, passage. Lovers of themselves. This is the center of the universe. Self, the glorification of our flesh, of our desires. And everything else that we do stems from a desire to make us God, to make us number one. And how how often do we see that in our own society? Just hop on any social media app and you see people talk, like focusing all the attention on themselves, making these long videos with the camera facing themselves, talking about their day or their lives or pulling silly pranks or doing all this stuff to build up their social media following. Because the more followers they get, the more attention they get, the more that feeds their ego and their self-esteem and the more it it feeds an opportunity to make money and, and advertising and building up a career. And these people, most of them don't even have a talent worth building a career around. They're not writers or artists or musicians. They're just people who want attention. Because they're lovers of themselves. Okay, this is the root of the secular religion. They don't want to worship an actual God who will tell them what to do and have uh, some sort of say in their life. They want to worship themselves. But the path to achieve, you know, self-made godhead or self-made godliness, okay, elevating themselves to being a god, at least in their own mind, believe it or not, they have to worship many other false gods to reach that. 
And that's a major uh, capstone, going back to Revelation 9, verse 20, of the secular religion. They have as many idols as any other pagan religion. It's not a, a monotheistic uh, idolatry. It's polytheistic. There are many false gods. Okay, in our world, a big church of the secular religion, like I said, is politics, particularly leftism. They worship race. They worship gender. They worship sexuality. They worship a variety of, of politicians and leaders. Same thing is true on the right. Okay, if you're a Christian and you consider yourself conservative, that's great, but you have to be careful. Just as much as you could fall into a trap on one end of the spectrum, you could fall into a trap on the other end, because on the right, they worship America, a country that will not exist forever. They worship uh, values and traditions and wealth and achievement and our families and our principles and working hard and the military. All these things are good in and of themselves, but when they become paths to your own self-worth, it's idolatry. And if that becomes more important to you, making a conservative, wonderful America over the kingdom of God, that's idolatry. And it's just as toxic and wicked as any other form of idolatry. Other people, their, their path to Godhead is, is wealth and a career. So they worship, you know, these investors and these CEOs and they get all these self-help books. They look at TED Talks and they try to find all these keys to making wealth and power. And their gods are, are their objects that they could earn with their money, their house, their car, their bank account. They're celebrities. Other people, it's, it's actors and entertainers and athletes or education or knowledge and so many different things. There's so many different paths because there's so many different false gods, just like every other pagan religion that's ever existed. There's all these different gods that represent different things that humanity wants. If you look at the old pagan religions back in the day, if you look at familiar with Greek mythology or Egyptian mythology, they were gods of the sun, gods of the moon, gods of the rain, gods that controlled the tides, gods that controlled the harvest and the plants and the animals, gods that controlled death and the afterlife, gods that controlled justice and war. So everything, <laughs> they made up gods for every aspect of their life that they cared about. And the more they cared about a particular thing, the more important those gods were. So a very warlike nation like the Vikings, they cared very much. Their chief gods were, were warriors. Civilizations that cared more about the harvest and nature and, and farming and ecology, which was very much, you know, wealth. They cared a lot about gods that cared about the harvest and wealth and rains and, and nature. So it's nothing new. It is nothing new. And what humanity does today, especially in the West, is what they care about. They prop up these little gods for themselves education, politics, money, celebrity, media, technology, possessions, whatever it is, they set it all up and they revere and adhere to it the same way a religious zealot adheres to their religious belief. You might agree with me that, oh yeah, these are all idols in people's hearts. I've talked, I've heard about that before. My church teaches that. But we have to understand it extends into every aspect of these people's lives. And you might be wondering right now in the world, why are people so crazy about these particular issues? Why are they willing to fight and riot and kill and cancel and, and attack people who disagree with them? Isn't this a culture where we agree to disagree? Isn't this a culture where we believe in free expression and opinion? No, these people are religious zealots that if you disagree with them, you're an enemy and they will seek to destroy you. And this is, becomes helpful when you try to articulate what's going on in the world. Okay, if you're trying to express the people to ask, why don't you agree with me on this particular issue? Right? In the summertime in America, it's pride and they, they celebrate homosexuality. Well, guess what? That's a part of their religion. Okay, they believe it's one of their tenets. Just like the Bible teaches that sex is between a man and a woman who are married. That's a biblical doctrine. Okay, their views of sexuality, which is directly to, opposed to the word of God, is a part of their religion, their tenets. That's why it's so important to them for them to force it onto you, just as much as any religious group will try to force onto you their own ideas about sex and marriage and relationships. So if they come to you and say, celebrate with us this immorality, and you say, no, I don't want to. Why not? You're a bigot? Do you hate us? You're evil. No, it's because they're part of a religion that teaches a lie. And I don't follow that religion. I follow the word of God. I follow the truth of the Bible. And I'm not going to agree with your religious beliefs because you're worshiping false gods that say that this type of sexuality is okay. It's incompatible with what I believe and what God, the one true God, says. And so you might have a hard time articulating that kind of thing with people. And you might say, well, no, I love people, but I'm against the sin. And that's true. And you may not have a hard time trying to understand the conflict between them and they believe, they disbelieve. If you understand that it's a religion, things become a lot more clear. They're following these things 
because they've been taught them in their secular public schools, in their homes, in their universities, in their offices. This uh, secular idolatry has permeated every aspect of our life. You know, once upon a time, Christianity had a huge impact on America's culture and on Europe's culture. Those times are gone. We're not going back to them. The only future we look forward to is the day that Christ Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and brings heaven on earth, and the kingdom of God is established on the earth. That's what we're looking forward to. We're not looking back. We can't bring back those old days. Not that they were great as people seem to remember them to be. People today, unless they repent and give their lives to Jesus Christ, are followers of a false religion. It's a secular religion. It has different flavors. It could be leftism. It could be conservatism. It could be LGBT. It could be racial. It could be social justice. It doesn't matter what the term is. It's a secular religion where they worship false gods in order to elevate themselves to a place of Godhead in their own minds. So what's our response? Our response is to cling greater, more and more to the Word of God, to be grounded and rooted in the Word of God so that we won't be tripped up or led astray by any false belief that is rooted in idolatry. So that when we are confronted with the world, when they bring at us these lies, and they don't understand why we don't agree with them, and they try to attack us and persecute us, because that happens everywhere, we can boldly, in love, in patience, speak the truth. They may not accept it. They may attack us all the more. They may reject us all the more. They may try to cancel us or, or, or turn people against us. But if we stand on God's word and boldly proclaim the truth, not backing down, not in some sort of judgmental attitude of hate, but in truth being expressed in love, as the Bible says, we will bring glory to the Lord. And we will receive great honor uh, from the, our Lord and Savior himself because we confessed the good confession. We stood by his word and God will intercede for us. God will work through us and God will bless us. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. Every episode is available on lightningpodcast.org.